Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Webb's online giant advent calendar. So, from the 1st right through to the 24th of December, Joe and I will be here and there'll be a short video each day released on our YouTube channel and on Facebook, where together we will be opening our giant advent calendar. There'll be lots of silliness and fun and jokes and treats, as well as the Christmas story. So do join us from six o'clock every day from the 1st to the 24th of December. Well, good morning, wherever you are watching from, we are really glad that you have joined us. Uh, some more notices will come up at the end, including all the stuff about our online Christmas services. But just to say that on Christmas Eve at five o'clock, there will be an outdoors carols and hot chocolate thing taking place at Williston Church in the churchyard there. Then on Christmas Day, there'll be an in-person uh, communion service at 9.15 at Eastern Mordet and then an all age communion service at 10.30 at Wollaston Church. Uh, so you will need to book in if you want to come to either of those services on Christmas Day. So let's pray as we begin our service today. Father, as we worship, we just are in need of your presence. As we worship, would you come and meet with us? Would you transform us? The Holy Spirit, that we give you permission to have more of us. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. He restores my soul.
Hi, my name is Chris Kandaya, and Christmas means to me the rescue of God. Uh, we were expecting a baby one Christmas and our big challenge was what are we going to call this child? And I thought of all sorts of different names it could be. I thought of calling our child Thor because no one's going to bully a child called Thor at school. And so, um, or maybe call the child Doctor because then they get a free doctorate before they even start studying. Wouldn't that be great? But Jesus' name was given to him by angels. Mary and Joseph didn't have to go through the same process my wife did. They were told to name their child Jesus, which means Jehovah is salvation, or a short form of that is God to the rescue. What a wonderful thing that Christmas is all about God stepping into our world so that he can rescue us from the trouble we've got ourselves into. So for me, Christmas is all about God rescuing us from our troubles. Merry Christmas to you. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. When I was little, I used to sit by the window and watch the world go by. And my, oh my, did the world go by because time flew, yes, time flies. And it carries us all to the day we're six feet deep with services by graveside. And all we ever really want is for it to be a great ride. So I used to sit in the back seat on the driver's side, passing time, and I'd watch every single car that passed us by, or at least I'd try. And at 10 years old, all I could think was, I wonder where they're gonna go on the day they die. Still to this day, I look out my window. And sometimes I roll it down and I let the wind blow. And I close my eyes and I listen to the sound of travelers traveling by with the sun on my face as it illuminates the sky. And I can still hear the sweet voice of my mom from those long Sunday drives. And she'd say, son, you can be anything that you want to be. And if it were up to me, I'd make you believe that God's plans for you aren't make-believe, they're reality. And mom, I've been out here living those dreams and I hope you're proud of me because you taught me what it's like to live life powerfully. You showed me what it's like to silence the voices of those who say life is only a pursuit of a salary. What a travesty. To live for money, it's a tragedy. So mom, to be rich with no faith, forget it. Because of you, broke is what I'd rather be. Because if money talks, I don't want it to talk to me. Because I'd rather be a poor man stuck in poverty than to be a slave to paper, refusing to trust in God's sovereignty. At 10 years old, I was inspired. I was inspired. I was inspired to live a life that inspires others to take off the flat tires and travel freely down the highway. Like I don't care what Satan tells me. Not one single thing is gonna stand in my way because I'd rather be out here being made fun of for Jesus than to be forgotten in my driveway. And let's be real, man, so many of us do. And we waste opportunities to get out there and spread truth. And we wake up at 85 and say, what happened to my youth? I never put it to use. Christians are afraid of letting their voice be heard, even more afraid of letting God's voice be heard through them, now realizing that their life is on display and it's a show for all to see like true men. And the dead men around them, by the power of their testimony, could become new men. We make excuses as to why we don't live sold out like, yo man, I'm just human. Yes, you are, but God isn't. And when he hung on that cross and said it is finished, he gave you a blank page of pen and said, here, write the first and last sentence. It's a war. Are you gonna sit on the sidelines or get up and get in this? Because it's a fight, man. Every day it's a battle for what's right. It's a fight for your life. And so often the wrong feels so right. But I read the last page of the Bible. Believe me, it's going to be all right. But until he comes like a thief in the night, I'm going to live this life like every day is a gift from God because every day is a gift from God. And God didn't give us this gift so that we would wallow and be set adrift into a sea of selflessness. Like what can I achieve and how much can I get? So we buy into this American dream, but really, it's just an American scheme. A suicidal society where we scorn the Tim Tebow's but celebrate the Charlie Sheen's and we wonder why we're losing the teens. And we wonder what it all means. It means that sin is on the rise, we bought into its lies, 
thank God Jesus is still in the business of saving lives and he can save yours just like he saved mine. And because he did, I don't have to focus on who I was or what I did because Jesus forgave. Yes, Jesus forgives. Not that we would drive through this life looking in the rear view at the old you because Jesus doesn't say, I told you. He only says, I love you. Three nails and two wooden beams. Believe me, man, he loves you and his promises are true and the Bible is truth and liberal professors who bash it are fools, but God still loves fools and I'm really no better than them. I'm just a messed up dude who struggles with sin. But I'm not about to deny my creator to get an A on a paper because one day my name will be written on a different piece of paper, whether it's soon or whether it's later. And someone in a suit and tie will stand on a stage as my loved ones cry and will say the year I was born and the year that I died. And when they call my name, I'll be far above the fray in a place far away, all because I chose Jesus over this. Because I didn't want to sell away my Savior like Judas with a wink and a kiss. You can't pump the brakes on life's highway. You can't go back and you can't go sideways. And if I had it my way, I'd go back to the 10-year-old me and I'd say, Clayton, don't waste one opportunity to pray. Be different from this world and stand out in every way because we're all just traveling to our grave. And when you stand before Jesus, what will you say? So let's uh, pray together. I'll try and leave a few moments of silence after each prayer. Lord, as our nation comes out of lockdown this week, we call upon your wisdom for our government and our leaders as they make future decisions. Father, we say thank you for our national leaders. And we are sorry when we are critical of them. Father, as our communities now try to decide how best to spend those precious five Christmas days, help us to be mindful of those for whom this is an especially painful season and to look towards those who need your love and your sensitivity. Father, we specifically bring to you those on our hearts who are bereaved or ill in some way. Father, we ask for your supernatural peace for them. And in this season of Advent, where perhaps our own hearts need warming towards you and uh, your purposes, maybe just a little more. Would you put your power to work in us to bring healing, reconciliation and transformation in our own lives and then through us so that others around us see you at work and come to know you. In your name, Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. So our reading this morning is taken from 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 to 15a. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. And the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for, for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire? But, in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation.
Amen. So let's look at this 2 Peter passage. To put it into some context first, many of the early Christians had a, an increasing expectation that the end times would happen in their lifetime. So the end times being that event where Jesus would come again in glory, uh, the kingdom would be fully established in a new heaven and a new earth, and those who belong to him will be vindicated and would inherit his kingdom in its fullness. And you see this increased expectation if you read other New Testament letters. And actually it's a common um, expectation, I think, even among some Christians today. Those of us who go to River Camp will have heard John Arnott, who is a real prominent worldwide church leader who's seen amazing things happen in his church and other churches. He was talking a few years ago about how he thought really the end times would happen in the next few years. Maybe he had uh, seen something about COVID and interpreted it as that. I remember when the Chernobyl nuclear disaster happened in 1986, many Christians were seeing that as a sign of the end times uh, and that they would happen in their lifetime. So I think it's a common expectation. Maybe some have thought of COVID in that way, I'm not sure. Anyway, what was being addressed though in this passage is that some false teacher viewed the apparent delay as the Lord being uh, slow to anger, one of his characteristics, and interpreting, interpreting that as lateness. And so because of this apparent lateness, they were encouraging some Christians into uh, a life of sin and moral um, deficient deficiency if you like and so peter was addressing that and he's saying in this passage look it's not a question of lateness god's view of time is not like our time you know with god he's outside of time a thousand years to him is it's like one day you know that in itself is a good reminder to us isn't it if we've been uh, hanging on to a promise of god or we've been waiting for a word from god to come into fulfillment you know, God's view of time isn't like ours. He's outside of time, which is really hard to get our heads around. Well, Peter was saying, look, it's not about lateness. This is about God's patience. And the very reason the end times haven't happened is because he's wanting all people to come to repentance and not to perish. But also he says, you know, but don't be lulled into thinking it won't happen. Because when it does, it'll be really dramatic. It'll be awesome. Even, uh, even a terrifying occasion. You know, look how it's described. The heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will be dissolved with fire. I think, to be honest, I'd rather not be around during the end times. I think I'd rather be with Jesus already in my mansion or my flat or my toilet block, whatever I'll get assigned. What can we do with passages like this one from 2 Peter chapter 3? Well, firstly, there's two things I want to talk about. Firstly, it's a reminder that there's a bigger picture going on. We are part of a bigger story which is the story of God working out his salvation plan across the earth. You know, the big picture is that this world of ours is morally corrupt. It is under the influence of the enemy. And Jesus has come to uh, destroy the work of the enemy, uh, which he did on the cross, and then to have a people so in love with him so empowered by him that our lives become channels whereby his kingdom becomes established upon the earth. As Chris Candia said in that video we watched, you know, Christmas actually is about uh, rescue, Jesus coming on a rescue mission. I don't know about you, I, I find it all too easy just to focus down on my immediate concerns in life and it's not that the detail of our life is unimportant you know our, our jobs especially at the moment our jobs our health and well-being how our children are developing and hopefully flourishing all these are hugely important you know I've said before if it matters to you it matters to your heavenly father 
life is to be lived to the full. But it's in the context, and it's good to be reminded of this, particularly in, uh, during Advent, our lives are lived in the context of God's big salvation story. And that, you know, that should be encouraging, actually, because it means no matter what hardship we're currently facing, no matter how much uncertainty or confusion, no matter even if we're facing death, God is on his throne, he is working out his purpose, our world is heading in one direction under his control, whereby the Father in Jesus is going to establish a new heaven and a new earth, and those who belong to him will inherit all that. And it's a reminder that uh, what was lived in this life will be a poor substitute to what is to come. For years I've been receiving um, pension statements and for years I've just ignored them, I just put them in a file. A few weeks ago during this second lockdown I received my latest pension statements and I'm going to confess something to you. Because one day uh, I took out all the statements from my file and I put them all in date order and I started to try and understand them. Apparently, you can take out um, a lump sum now. Lord, is that, a, is that enough for a new motorbike, I thought. But anyway, I started to think through what retirement might be like. You know, do we want to sail around the world? Do we want to travel the world on a motorbike? Do we want to sit in our conservatory and do the garden every day? Probably none of those things. Because we, while I will retire from being a vicar, of course, I don't think I ever want to retire from being about God's business. I want to keep in God's story and have influence in that story. I want to see others come to salvation. If we believe this Peter passage, the Lord is being patient because he does not want people to perish. It's a serious story to be part of. You know, I'm still doing too many funerals whereby people think their loved one is going off to meet all their other lost loved ones uh, in this lovely place called heaven because essentially they've just been a good person. It just doesn't work that way. Jesus died to get people into eternity. It cost him. So I want to be part of God's big picture, his big story, his salvation story, until I die. So firstly, this passage and others like it remind us we're a part of a bigger drama being played out. Our lives are on a bigger canvas. Whatever metaphor you want to use, you get the gist. What else can we do with this passage, passages like this? Well, secondly, believing that Jesus will come again, that God will issue in a new age, a new heaven and an earth, it should motivate us to live well in the present. And this was Peter's point in this passage. You know, it says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? We well, ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed it's coming. You now, if the new age isn't being ushered in according to our short term <clears throat> expectations, it doesn't mean we can just live however we like in a morally deficient way, if you like. It should motivate us to live well. You now, why should we want to align our lives with something that isn't going to last, in other words, with something that actually is going to be um, destroyed and condemned? Rather, it makes sense to align our lives with righteousness, as it says here. I love that phrase in verse 13. We wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. You know, I know that word righteousness is, is complex in meaning, but simply we have a righteousness from God given to us 
because of what Jesus did on the cross. So if we align our lives with righteousness, in other words, if our behavior is consistent with who we are, the righteous ones, then the new age will be like going home. Uh, where, that mean, where that word has the very best meaning attached to it. So it's a place of comfort, safety, rest, refreshment, a place where we, we can be ourselves, where there's no pretense or falsehood. So let's align our lives with righteousness because that is where we're heading, we're going home. And we do that, of course, with, again, something Peter talks about here, by living a life of repentance, which is a great Advent word. You know, it just means, doesn't it, just to change our thinking, to turn away from what we know is wrong to what we know really is right. Repentance is the precursor to becoming a Christian, but it's also a habitual way of living for the Christian. And repentance, you know, let's remind ourselves of this, Repentance is a great blessing. It may not seem it like first because it attacks our pride. You know, that part of us that screams, I'm not that bad. I don't really do much wrong. God will be happy with, uh, won't mind that bit of my life rather. But repentance is a blessing because repentance brings freedom. The freedom that forgiveness brings, the freedom that uh, being at peace with God brings it's a blessing so when we think about the end times we can stand in confidence and say to God you have examined my life I have received your salvation your forgiveness welcome me home Amen
for joining us this morning if you uh, would like to contact us or ask for prayer then please use the contact details that will come up at the end and also please stay uh, for the other notices that will also come up at the end so Emmanuel God with us would you bless us with outrageous hope hope of new birth and new beginnings hope of peace on earth and the hope from being found in you have a blessed week this week Amen. Starlight shines, the night is still, shepherds watching from a hill. I close my eyes. Perfect child, gently ways, a mother bends to kiss God's face. I close my eyes, see the night when love was born. Perfect child.